evening and welcome to AFMX 2021, the virtual edition. My name is Ivan Wiener. I'm the executive director of the Albuquerque Film and Music Experience. What a fantastic week as we enter into the evening hours of AFMX here in New Mexico. Just an incredible program we've had since Monday. Uh, and if you've missed any of it, go to afmxnm.com and you can access the virtual festival. All of the events and movies, even the ones you missed earlier in the week, are available uh, through, through October 11th. So don't forget to check everything out. Some amazing, amazing programming. Uh, before we get started with this Q&A, uh, we have the filmmakers from Witness here. Um, I, I just wanted to thank some of our presenting sponsors. Not some, but all of them. That would be the polite thing to do. Um, AFME Foundation, Albuquerque Film Office, and Film Liaison, Cindy McCrossan, Albuquerque the Magazine, Bernalillo County Commissioner, Stephen Michael Quezada, Breza Terena Olive Oil, Comcast NBC Universal, Real Solutions Airport Meet and Greet Service, Sunny 505, the Baker Law Group, University of New Mexico Film and Digital Arts, Wells Fargo Advisors and Larry Schwartz, Yamaha Entertainment Group, and Jalsco Road Productions. Once again, for the complete lineup of our events, visit afmxnm.com. Let's get the show on the road with this Q&A. I want to introduce our Director of Operations, Kira Seifler. Hi, Ivan. Thank you. I'm sorry. I was giggling in the background. You're so... You're so entertaining. I just want to say thank you to Melody Carlisle, who is our technical director. She is helping us on the back end, making sure we all sound and look great. So thank you, Melody. Um, also, uh, another couple of announcements about our center stage conversations. Tomorrow, we have Buffy St. Marie um, scheduled for 2.30 Mountain Time. Uh, this was originally scheduled for Friday. We are moving it to Sunday. So Sunday, September 26th at 2.30 Mountain Time. Um, also a reminder that we will also have an award ceremony at 7 p.m. Uh, Mountain Daylight Time. And everybody gets a chance to vote on their favorite film. So if you've missed that opportunity, go back and vote for your favorite films. There will be an audience favorite category. So please make your vote count. Excuse me. Uh, before I, I introduce this next block, uh, which is block 14, featuring Adrian Sutherland's polit Politician Man, Witness, and the LaDonna Harris Indian 101 documentary. Just um, another reminder, lots of reminders, to enter any questions you may have for the filmmakers. We will do our very best to get all of the questions answered during this time. Now on to introducing our fantastic moderator, Barbara Bittmeyer. She is one of AFMX's longtime volunteers. She graduated from UNM in 2002 with a BA in American Studies um, and in Native American Studies. She is a 30 year volunteer for the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center. She's been an usher at Pope Joy Hall um, for special events and has been with AFMX since its inception. You can also look for Barbara as a background actor in Better Call Saul, In Plain Sight, Independence Day, Prism, Star, and Cookie. Please welcome Barbara. <laughs> Hello, and thank you, Kira, for that wonderful introduction. I hope I can live up to it. <laughs> I am absolutely delighted to uh, welcome people watching now who have had the wonderful experience of enjoying these three films in this block and tonight we're going to be talking with the director of the, the uh, film Witness and also uh, one of the artists who is featured in that film. So first of all I wanted to uh, welcome Penny Phillips, who's in uh, Los Angeles, in the wonder of uh, Wi-Fi, and also uh, Deborah Hohola, who is in her Pueblo of Isleta. She's also connected to the Hemis Pueblo, and I've known Deborah for a long time, and I'm delighted to meet Penny. So um, let's get on with the question and answer. And what I'd like to do is, first of all, to ask Penny, where did the name witness 
come from? And why is that the name of your film? Um, that's a great question. The witness is um, acknowledging the blankets and the stories behind them and the events that happen. Um, I think that uh, Bobby Connor explained it really well that when you go to a dance and um, you're given a blanket, that blanket is a memorial or it's, um, it acknowledges that you were there and that you witnessed this. And it's, and I think that Marie Watt took it further or in a different uh, way was showing um, her, her uh, Hudson Bay blanket with the embroidery on it. She called that blanket witness. So we asked her if we could have permission to use that because we're witnessing history, memory, story, and it just seemed to fit. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. That's um, given it a, a very much wider uh, idea. And of course, that's what the film is. But where, where Penny, did you get the inspiration for, for doing this story? Um, well, my partner, uh, Bill Spader, and I have seen these blankets at various events over and over. You see them in photographs and you see them on horseback. Um, um, they just seem to be such a, a, an important part of Native culture, but we knew they weren't Native made. And then we were at the Holly, Holly Ford Museum up in Salem, and we saw a Marie Watts sculpture of, it was just a, a, a cylinder or just a, of a stack of blankets. And each blanket had a story from the person that had donated it. And the stories were wonderful. And we thought, I thought, well, um, documentary making is all about story. And uh, so that was the first kind of, you know, I thought, well, maybe we can find the story from Native people of why these blankets are so important. Mm -hmm. And so we just proceeded from there. It sort of evolved, <laughs> I guess. That's wonderful. And, and Deborah, you would go along with the fact that blankets are really important to oh, yeah yeah i mean it's they're very purposeful in our culture i mean uh they're given at birth and you take them with you when you leave this earth to the next life so they 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 really do belong to you and they really do witness your your lifetime as um as people within the community that are celebrating um, whatever it may be, or, you know, or it's it's just a part of them in, in what they have to carry with them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it is very important. And um, Penny, the, the process, because you have, as we, um, you said that you start with, the ancient uses, um, including the pot latches, which are from the north. Um, and then you go all the way through to modern art. And uh, how, how did you manage the process with this long um, story line? Well, we had some really wonderful people that um, worked with us. And it's really, um, we had Barry Friedman, who spent 40 years studying blankets, and um, Barbara, I'm sorry, I'm sorry um, Bonnie um, Connor, who has lived it and is so great with the, knows so much about Northwest history, and, and Steve Graff from the Mary Hill Museum, they all contributed, and we thought we wanted to tell the story of how the blankets came here, they were trade items, Mm -hmm. They were they were Pendleton items, uh, or not, I'm sorry, Hudson Bay blankets that arrived and they were really important. And um, as Bobby Connor told us that they were, they took the place of um, other, um, other coats that were happening at the time because, and they were, they were beautiful, they were colorful, they were available. So they found a way in. Um, 
and then um, the, the trade blankets really came in at, at, during the reservation period. And so we wanted to get that just to give some history of it, but it, it's really the, the native people that um, that we interviewed that gave us the story of the meaning the blankets have in their life. And so all we were trying to do is just find the story and record it um, as accurately as possible. And so it was great to find Deb and, you know, and have, she was so open about what they meant and in her culture and, and her beautiful blanket that she made. So, Deborah, do you, can you come in on that and let us know if there are stories of your blankets, your families and, and friends and the blankets that, I mean, we know your one from the film and that's amazing and wonderful. And I love the way you showed it to your father um, mm. up there. And, but have you got other stories about blankets that you can share? I think, uh, yeah, I mean, there's stories, numerous stories. I mean, not just uh, my personal story, but stories within our families, you know, uh, blankets that have been passed down through grandparents um, and, you know, how they're old and how they tear. And that brings back memories of, you know, what happened when this hole appeared, you know, in this blanket, they were might be on a hunting trip with a clan or, you know, just carrying it um, through ceremony. And, you know, it has a certain story about a certain time. And that's what I feel like blankets do, you know, they, mm -hmm. they, um, they are kept with such um, care. Mm -hmm. And they also, um, tell different events that happen during the time that this blanket is being used. So it's not just one story, it's multiple stories that are constantly being told and also also emerging with these blankets at the same time. So I think it's it's kind of like a timeline of mm -hmm. whoever owns these blankets can tell you different events and can also share different stories of you know, even when they got the, the blankets, it, it was people get blankets when they're born, people get blankets when they marry, people get blankets when they graduate, you know, it's always about something achieved, you know, so it's always something good. So I think that's, um, that's a good, that's a good, you know, genre of, of things to share with a blanket. That's what that's wonderful. Yeah. Penny, um, there's a, there's a whole, uh, lot of other things that I wanted to know about blankets. You have so many really wonderful colored blankets paired up there. Are they from a specific collection? Oh, well, we were really lucky that we were able to get, um, um, access to the blankets, both at Pendleton from their, um, from their slides oh. and also, uh, Barry Friedman has a wonderful collection that he shared with us. Yes. So yes. Uh, we, were get, we were able to get some of the older blankets and then he has a, a great collection himself. Um, so that's where most of them came from. They're, they're wonderful. I love them because some of them are the back and the front, perhaps? Yeah, we, that, I'm sorry that that didn't get in, that there's a the back and the front have different, it's just a, um, a function of the weaving process yeah. that, that they reverse colors on the other side. Um, that's, that was a good point to point out. So there's an A side and a B side, but some, you know, depending on what you like better. <laughs> that, that's wonderful. So um, I was going to ask you um, how you picked the, Bucky Echo Hawk, um, for instance, because you've got these wonderful uh, variety of um, speakers and how they've used their art, like Deborah um, and then uh, Marie Watt, who used art in a different fashion, but again with the blankets. So, how did you pick these people? 
Well, we started with Marie, and then uh, we were looking for contemporary artists, contemporary Native designers, who had, because the arc of the story, it started with the trade blankets, the Hudson Bay blankets, and then it's gone to now Native designers, in uh, some cases, in, in, and also it's included in, in uh, art installations. So that's what we wanted to show that that the sign of, you know, the culture is, it's vibrant, it's happening. And yeah. Bucky was certainly happening. He, <laughs> um, he did the wonderful pathway blanket and he was just, you know, he's, he just fit what we, we needed. We called him and he agreed. We uh, flew out to Oklahoma to where he was and he spent a day with us. He was just lovely. And he put it together for us. He put the story together, how mm -hmm. they were used. and. Um, much like Deborah, that it just, and then he brought it to uh, the contemporary weavers that he was so proud to be a part of, um, mm -hmm. and, the, and the artists. And so that's okay. And Deborah, we were looking for a Pueblo um, artist, and she was perfect. And we called her, and she was so, so kind to, uh, it was in the middle of Zoom by the time we got to Deborah. So we had to, I mean, I'm sorry, the middle of uh, COVID. So we couldn't travel. So we did a, a Zoom and several Zoom interviews with her. And um, then we have a good friend that is and an excellent cinematographer, Roy Graff, um, who lives not too far away. And he spent an evening with, with Deborah and got the beautiful view of her. Um, and I hear they had a good dinner afterwards. <laughs> so. That's kind of, we just, we, got lucky. we just got lucky with these people. Did you have, did you have others that you sort of took part of the shooting uh, shot a bit, but then decided that wouldn't work in the, in the film? Um, no, we had others. We really wanted to record a, a Windy Red Star and Natalie Ball and, you know, some the real contemporary ones that we tried to get as many Native designers in at, as possible, um, but during COVID, it was we were traveling and and the reservations were closed and um, so that's how that happened. And but we thought we got enough of the story to really tell it. But I would love to include dancing, um, but of course there was no dancing going on. Yeah, um, this is wonderful to see the blankets dance. They just they're just so. Um, pretty. <laughs> you know um, and I think you you mentioned to me that um, Deborah did some of her own recording. All right. Well, Deb can talk about that, right? <laughs> oh. Over to you, Deborah. I don't know how I did it. <laughs> but, uh, I was sent a tape recorder and a microphone by Penny, and she. Um, would interview me through Zoom. And first, it wasn't an interview. We just started to converse about really who I was, my art, and my people, and my culture. And then um, little by little, she started to squeeze these questions in. And all that time, I was recording myself, and she was able to listen to everything on her end. And it kind of happened like that for several sessions. And um, and I would download it and send it to her. So it was, I can't remember too clearly because it was like two years ago, it seems like. And um, I just been through so much different um, projects in the, in the time since COVID and recording that video in that movie in that film that um you know it was just very challenging and I learned something new so it was very um new to me and you know I'm one that don't like to be recorded you know we all get like oh I sound terrible and and you know I'm the one that doesn't really like to even get pictures taken so you know we get like that you know we get the we get our own phobias that we place on ourselves and um and Penny helped me break that because she was 
she's very um, calm and her prasanna is very pleasant and she makes you feel so relaxed that it doesn't matter what you talk about before you know it, you're just you know opening up to her and and we're just having a, a nice conversation that's and that's funny. basically what how it became what it is it was just her and I getting to know each other mm -hmm. that's that's uh, that's wonderful and the fact that you were in different places for these different um sections that you had to find local did you find other local crew besides Ron? Um, no, um, we, um, no, that was the only, um, Deborah's was the COVID interview, that, you know, during COVID is when we got to record a Deborah, but um, the others we had actually gone up to and, and, and done, so that was good. And one, one of them, the one with Bobby Connor, she's so, we went up to uh, the museum where she works up in Pendleton, and she's the director of the Timmis Club. I think I said that right, Cultural Institute. And um, she was so, she just sat down and gave us 30 minutes of wonderful history. And yeah. so we got that. And it wasn't fancy camera work like yours, but we got enough of it that we could, you know, the story. We, we were interested in the story. Uh -huh. But, but, Deb was a really quick study because she got that how to use that tape recorder really quickly. And then she recorded her mother and her stories. And so mm -hmm. I was excited to see that go on. I saw I saw Deborah's mother in one of the photographs. I recognized her. Yes. <laughs> very young when she was very young. <laughs> but the one before was how I recognized her with her gray hair leaning mm. over. Oh, yes, yes, bright red. Yes. And that was a cultural, actually. That was a uh, a family gathering that, uh, you know, it's never just family when it's an important event uh, that was with all the neighbors and the community coming out to help uh, for a ceremony that was taking place for our family, my mom's family in Hamas. And, in that one slide or clip there, that's my mom with all her sisters and my aunts and my sister-in-law and my sister. And we're all laughing and sharing stories around an outside fire, frying bread for the ceremony. <laughs> that, that's wonderful. That, that sort of encompasses what a, a blanket of family, the whole family. Exactly. Yes, perfect. Now, um, I wanted to know um, also, um, did you talk to uh, Marie about her uh, picture? Uh, the first one that you show has got coyotes and uh, a lying down coyote, I guess. And she has some kind of, um, I, I don't know how it is that they, she makes the Help sort of stand out. Did that was that, to your knowledge, um, something to do with textiles? Well, she really um, she loved wool, and she said it's part of the creation story of the Seneca people, um, where the animals came down and helped um, the first people um, mm -hmm. survive. And so, and some, and that was one of her. Uh, one of the things that I thought was wonderful that she is one of the reasons she likes wolves because it's connected to an animal. So we really wanted to share her. Her work is really beautiful. And, um, and she was able to put it together in a, um, in a broad, her, the idea of memory and, and story. She was able to give us a broad context of, of not just Native people, but other people, you know, and I, I started thinking about the blanket that I had as a child that dragged around as a toddler and um, how personal they are. And um, she yeah. put that all together. And, uh, so it was wonderful to work with her. She was That's, generous yeah. with her. I loved her um, real 
um, interest in the old pot latches and how, although they were cut off, they were continued. And that wonderful photograph with the, that she's transcribed into a, a whole huge blanket with embroidery from that picture where they're tossing the blanket. And, uh, and that makes me think of the Indians who use tossing the blanket as one of their sports. So it's, you know, the blanket comes up all over everywhere. Um, now, this, we're hoping that this um, exposure here at AFMEX is going to um, get people all involved in wanting to see more of uh, the witness documentary and also things that you may be doing in the future. Have you got an idea of what you would like to do uh, to get uh, more exposure for your um, wonderful film? Um, well, we we're hoping that it goes to schools and to native communities. Um, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we're just so grateful that it's gotten into this festival, which is because it's such a wonderful festival. And, um, and we, um, in terms of the future, it seems to me that when I first started working with, um, with documentary and, and native artists, there weren't that many native artists recording their stories. And, and now there are. And it's wonderful, and I, I and I really support that. Um, so it's their time, and um, so I'm not sure. I, you know, in terms of the next one, I'm not really sure, but I'm grateful for the ones I have been able to make. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's a really good uh, teaching um, film. Now, Deb, you are really diverse as an artist. You've got your um, Pot, you, you know, your uh, pictures, you've got your frescoes, your wonderful frescoes. You did a lot of um, watercolor paper uh, art that you took out to uh, Russia. And are you still doing that? What are you, what are you concentrating on now? Oh, gosh, yeah, I, I am still learning. Um, and experimenting with my frescoes and doing very well with them. Um, very proud to say that um, they've got a couple of them got selected for public art purchase. So they'll be in uh, museums locally Good. or in public uh, community centers. Uh -huh. And um, yeah, and I'm constantly doing um, um, design work uh, for a local, I'm doing a design work right now for a local firm on mm -hmm. some branding designs. I am working at um, open space in Albuquerque. There's uh, many local lands <laughs> that are being um, preserved and protected by the city of Albuquerque. <laughs> so I just recently got uh, selected to paint a mural at one open space on Coors. Yeah. And my son and I will be doing the mural on that. And okay. um, <laughs> are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> and then I will be doing the um, another open space here in, um, in Albuquerque and hopefully be doing some future work with them. So, you know, plus my personal artwork, I think it's just, um, it's just, evolving with time. I mean, everything comes at once or it mellows out for a couple of days, then it's back at it. So I'm always busy. And my <laughs> art is, and it basically is all work dealing with creativity. So I love it. So that, you know, um, you will, if you, if you uh, know the um, Indian 101 that was before our film, um, and they have the four R's, these, uh, the, um, and one of them is redistribution. And so are you teaching your son? Is he oh, yeah, yeah. He's oh. like amazing. He's, he's no longer my, my mentee. He's my assistant and like more or less my boss right now sometimes. 
but uh yeah he's learned quickly and he always says when do i get a raise so he's learned very quickly <laughs> yeah but but yeah i mean i'm really happy that um he's he's taking on that uh that challenge of being an artist i mean it's it's uh -huh. a challenge and <laughs> and native art is so important because it it preserves who we are it preserves our culture it it somewhat tells our story and it's constantly evolving with time and and as we grow as individuals and and people in in you know in um in a space that everybody needs to see what is important to to save our planet and preserve our language and our culture and our values and reteach them to the next generation so i hope he learns to pass that down uh with my daughter and my grandkids can see it and my all my little my little trees grow to be tall and strong and <laughs> and share and share in life like we all want them to be you know and I think it's just important that art is is a part of that dialogue. Great. Great. That's wonderful. And what about getting your art out? Are there any websites or places that you would really like your um, art, both of you, to get out there? Do you have any ideas? Yeah. Well, I I'll let you go, Penny. Okay. <laughs> I've got a website, membranesfever.com. And um, and we are in a couple of other festivals now. Mm -hmm. um, one up in Portland and one in San Francisco. We're thrilled to be in, in that one as well. So that's kind of how we're doing it. I'm not really good on the promotion part. I really kind of fall down there. But, <laughs> but um, I'm hoping that the person who does our website can help me out with that, with all the different Twitter and the different yes. uh, places to put, you know, your art out. <laughs> Deb, do you put yours out on the? Yes, I have a website is uh, debhoholaart.com. So uh, you can look at my work. I will be updating that soon, hopefully, once I get a little time and uh and my work is in public places now, so mm -hmm. you can yeah. see them at the Coronado um, Historic Site in Bernalillo, and um, the Isleta Library has a large collection of my work, which is also public art, although the Pueblos are closed still due to yeah. COVID. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I've got uh, things coming up. Uh, just Google my name and you can find new things to read about every now and then. Good. Good. We're looking forward to that. Oh, now have any either of you got a, a good story that came up during the making of this film? Penny, what if what can you think of? Sorry, they were all so good. Um <laughs> let me think, let me think. A good story. Um gosh. Um I'm trying a blank because we were so into all the stories. I think the, some of the stories that we read about the blankets that were on the notes to the blankets and the Maria Watt. Um, that's the first thing that comes to mind. One of them was, this is a blanket that we used to keep warm um, that my parents or grandparents used in 1923 in our old Studebaker, this kept us warm. And another was, um, this is a blanket that our children used when we went on vacation and, um, and another, this is a blanket we were given at a marriage and a poem was, a, a beautiful poem was attached to it. Huh. So most of the, um, most of the stories have come about the blankets. The, yes, the, I think you could do another film of uh, Marie's um, blankets that she collected with those, sorry, and they were little, um, teasers because I was trying to read them and they would go through and go too quickly. Yeah, they went way too fast, but it was just the idea that each blanket that she wanted to point out that each blanket had its own unique story and mm -hmm. um, that they were markers for, you know, for our lives in a lot of ways. They follow us. Yeah. Um, so it was just opened my, um, my 
my thoughts about what the importance of a like to a person. Uh, so. <laughs> and Deb, when you Deborah, when you were doing your um, section in there, did you have any funny stories that happened while you were filming? Or <laughs> um, I didn't really have any funny. I not that I can remember. But I, I, you know, I kept referring back to my mother and and jotting her memory on um, when I was little, because um, Penny also asked me that question, like, what is your memories of your blanket when you were little? So, of course, I had to go to my mother and talk to her about what what I had. And she said, I had a little green blanket that was uh, with pink uh, roses and Every time I was not happy with where they put me or I guess whatever they made me sit still so I wouldn't run around, I would bite on my blanket. So the edge of my blanket was all torn up. So I thought that was pretty funny to hear of what I did when I was, uh, I guess, a younger um, child in the family. And I, I'm the youngest in the family, so I'm pretty sure I got a lot of attention. <laughs> And when I did, I bite, I bit my my blanket up. Well, this has been absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your stories and your wonderful film with us. And I'd just like to tell everybody to keep going into K um, Albuquerque Film X N M and uh, dot com and check out these wonderful films. If you have, haven't seen them already, or even if you have, watch them again, especially Witness, which was one of my very favorites. So thank you, Penny Phillips. Thank you, Deborah Hohola. And good night, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Barbara, Deborah, and Penny. Thank you so much for sharing your time today. I totally agree with Barbara. If you can get a chance to watch the film Witness, it's very educational, it's informative, inspiring, and illuminating. So please take the time to watch it. And if you need to watch any of our other films, they will be available online until October 11th. And make sure to vote for your favorite blocks or your favorite films, because we will be... Um, announcing our award winners on Sunday, September 26th at 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time on Facebook. So catch us on our Facebook page for that. Next up at 6.30 uh, Mountain Standard Time is our next feature film, Bone Cage. I highly recommend this independent film. Uh, later on, we will have our moderator, Andy Kaslick, who will conduct the filmmaker uh, Q&A. So I hope you can stay tuned for that. Until then, if you need more information about our events, go to afmxnm.com and um, check out what we have in store for you tomorrow. Lots of great stuff. All right. Until then, have a good evening.